Um, good evening. My name is Michael Power. I'm a public interest lawyer based in South Africa, and I'm an advisor to the protest rights and policing thematic area within the international network of civil liberties organizations. Alongside the outbreak of COVID-19, I think it's fair to say that 2020 was a year of protest. Despite governments imposing significant restrictions on gatherings, protests have played a prominent part in the pandemic, whether as a part of ongoing social movements like in Chile, Hong Kong, France, or India, or were catalyzed by ineffective governmental responses to the pandemic, such as in Brazil, Kenya, and South Africa. New protest movements have also emerged during the pandemic in response to police brutality, both inspired by BLM or due to ongoing systemic issues like the anti-SARS protests that we've seen in Nigeria. In many instances, police services have responded with excessive force, killing peaceful protesters, and on occasion in their own homes or in quarantine facilities, as we've seen in South Africa and Kenya. In some instances, COVID-19 regulations have enabled excessive force, and in, other, in others, uh, authorities have simply just turned a blind eye. So with the benefit of hindsight, we get together to determine what we've learned over the course of the past year and what it is that we as civil society should do going forward. So it's within this context that we welcome you to this Inclo side event on the margins of the 68th session of the African Commission. And it's titled Pandemics and Protest, a review of the right to protest in Africa. Now briefly, for those who aren't aware of the network, INCLO, or the International Network of Civil Liberties Organizations, is a network of 15 independent national human rights organizations from different countries in the global North and South who work together to promote fundamental rights and freedoms by supporting and mutually reinforcing the work of member organizations in their respective countries and by collaborating on a bilateral and multilateral basis. Notably, the Kenya Human Rights Commission and the Legal Resources Center, who are participants this evening, are both members of the network. So most importantly, I think we're joined with four uh, wonderful panelists. The first is Osai Ojigo, the country director for Amnesty International Nigeria. Second is Martin Mavangina, program advisor for transitional justice at the Kenya Human Rights Commission. Thirdly, we have Edwin Makwati, a legal researcher at the Legal Resources Center in South Africa. And last, but certainly not least, we have Mr. Emerson Sykes, who's a staff attorney from the American Civil Liberties Union, working in the Speech Privacy and Technology Project. So unfortunately, Maina Kiai is no longer able to present a keynote uh, as originally arranged. So we're going to slightly alter the, the nature of this particular webinar. We're going to give each one of the panelists seven minutes, if that's okay with all of you, to engage in a, a sort of a country review of the right to protest in your specific jurisdictions over the past year. And you know, what we want to reflect on during the course of this webinar is three. Uh, we have three effective objectives. The first is we're hoping to facilitate a discussion on the effect of COVID-19 um, on the right to protest in Africa and particularly putting under the microscope the conduct of law enforcement agencies in response to protests. This is particularly in Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa. We're then hoping to develop the conversation and look at what mechanisms we can now use to seek accountability for rights violations, particularly violations of the right to protest during the past year. And then lastly, we hope to reflect on what steps should be taken to mitigate future rights violations, uh, particularly of the right to protest in South Africa. So we'll split this webinar into two parts. The first will be the four presentations. The second then we hope to open up into a conversation with all panelists. So please feel free to use the chat to note your thoughts or comments. You're welcome to post to the group or you can send questions for the participants to me directly. Alternatively, you're welcome to use the Q&A function, but we're really looking for an engaging discussion for the last half an hour of this particular webinar so that we can start looking towards hopefully affecting positive change and looking for sustainable remedies to ensure that we can mitigate future and further rights violations as the pandemic increases and thereafter. So with that, um, Asai, thank you so much for taking the, the time to join us this evening. 
Amnesty has been tracking the activities of the, the special anti-robbery squad or SARS. For a long time, you released a damning report in 2016. But last year on the 8th of October, everything changed. Would you mind taking us through uh, the anti-SARS protests and everything that's flowed thereafter? Thank you so much. And um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, um, everyone, wherever you're joining from. Uh, Amnesty International has been actively involved in addressing issues of police brutality in Nigeria and beyond, in particular with the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, which is a tactical unit of the Nigerian police, uh, was set up to tackle heinous crimes like armed robbery, kidnapping. But it turned out that after years of his establishment, it started branching off into other things, extortion, um, uh, unlawful killings, arbitrary arrests. And because they were such a powerful and efficient unit, they got away with a lot of things, a lot of disciplinary issues that could have been addressed. And then they now became a menace to society. So Amnesty International's first report in 2016 was to draw attention to the fact that you have a unit that is a law on its own and needed to be reined in. Sadly, the recommendations we made in that report were not taken seriously, which included disbanding the units to make sure they were properly trained, addressing the human rights abuses which they had committed, and compensating victims and their families for the losses that they have experienced. So in 2020, incidentally, we had released another report, Time to End Impunity, in June, because we kept receiving several more cases. And now we're even able to then look at the position from previous years to know that they've narrowed their targets now to young people, particularly young men in their, uh, between the ages of um, 17 and um, 30. So that meant that it was almost like an attack on the youth. So when a few months down the line, you now had the NSAS protest, which engulfed nationally it was not due to just one singular event, but it had been building up over the years. In fact, in 2017, there had also been a big online protest um, trending with NSAS hashtag to draw attention to some of the issues. And the government began to claim that they were doing reforms. But young people particularly did not feel they were heard. And I've always said this, that Nigeria has an abusive and complex relationship with its people and with the right to protest in particular about how people express themselves and share their opinions is mixed, is layered with cultural, traditional, colonial laws and everything else in between. So it's, it's sometimes difficult to picture it, but I will just attempt to do so in the few minutes I have. So we had a police act that we only amended since Nigeria had its independence in 1960. We only amended that law in 2020. So you can imagine the laws which um, the police and other law enforcement agencies were relying on. These were laws that were created to keep colonized people in particular places to ensure that they do not challenge the existing authority. But Nigeria had then evolved over the years. We were under military rule. We came back into the civilian dispensation. But we continued to use these very archaic laws in order to dominate and in order to suppress uh, free speech as well as dissenting voices. And so looking at right to protest throughout leading to the answers shows that Nigeria has always found ways through which it can limit that right, often trying in the past to ask for police permit before people could come out. Even though the courts have settled it, you still find that we have to notify the police before you can come out. COVID-19 provided an opportunity for young people to reflect, where are we as a country? Nigeria also turned 60 years, October 1st. A few days before the first NSAS protests sparked, and then it became a national protest led by young people. One, because they were targeted by this unit. Two, because they want to see a different future for the country. And three, they had lost complete uh, faith in the authorities to change the system. And that is why Nigeria inability to use that moment 
to address some of the underlying issues about a tactical unit that started off fantastically resolving issues within the community and has now become um, a big problem, even for the police, because our research showed that even the police leadership could not rein them in. Nigeria failed to use that opportunity because we were still working, the authorities were still working within this framework that they control the space, they determine who speaks, and anyone that comes in their way will be dealt with. And sadly, that led us to the 20th of October, 2020, with the shooting at the Lekki Toll Gate, where people were shot at, injured, maimed. Some people are living with long-term disabilities and injuries. And it just points, it just gave us a tempo into the kinds of ways the authorities have been tackling protests in Nigeria up to that point. They've, and since even um, the moment of the answers, we've had a few other pockets of protests. But the issue now is you're breaching COVID-19 um, regulations. You're not wearing a mask. We had one earlier this year where some young people, including led by a prominent um, Nigerian artist, comedian, um, Mr. Macaroni came out and said, look, you cannot open the Lekki toll gate until the panel has finished its work. The panel that is reviewing what had happened had finished its work and justice has been heard for the victims and the survivors. And the police came and arrested them for breaching COVID-19 regulations. They were wearing masks and they didn't even allow them to gather. They shipped them right off um, from the venue. So we are seeing another tool using COVID-19 restrictions, claiming that protests cannot take place because there's no way anybody can maintain a safe distance of two meters. But more importantly, we are seeing state overreach because mobile courts were set up to maintain these regulations. And for a country that has struggled with pushing cases for justice, they were able to prosecute quite a number of people who had broken the regulations. So a lot still needs to be learned, but most importantly, because we've not accepted as a nation that protest is a human right protected by the constitution. And Nigeria has signed up to several international treaties, including the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And therefore has a responsibility to ensure they facilitate protesters. We continue to fall into this circle and COVID-19 just exacerbated it. I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. So thank you so much for those, you know, those really insightful comments. And I, you know, what struck me and something that we may want to develop as, as we move in, into a dialogue is this notion of people having the chance to reflect and post that as a result of COVID-19 and that reflection ultimately manifest, manifesting in protest action and a dissatisfaction with the systems already in place. So I think it's a really interesting point that you, you bring up in the context of COVID-19 and something that we may want to develop as, as we continue through this webinar. Martin, if I can then, you know, turn to the Kenyan context. And, you know, if we look at the large arrests of activists that took place, particularly during the Saba Saba March on the 7th of July last year, if I'm correct, I think over 50 activists were detained um, in the midst of that particular protest. What have you seen in the Kenyan context and, and where do we go from here? Okay, uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. I am pleased to be here uh, to give you perspectives from Kenya. So uh, I'll give a brief context to background. So for the longest time, Kenyans have used uh, the right to protest so freely, uh, demonstrate against bad governance, uh, corruption, and uh, mismanagement of public finance or, 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 or any other fundamental human rights violations. So on the 13th of March, 2020, the government of Kenya uh, announced that it had recorded its first, uh, 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 its first case of COVID-19. And with that came a raft of measures to contain the spread of, pan of, of the pandemic. Some of these measures included uh, the establishment of a national emergency response committee through an executive order to be chaired by uh, the cabinet secretary for health, a reduction in the number of passengers in public service vehicles, a dust to dawn curfew, banning of public gatherings, and uh, uh, most importantly, uh, social distancing and wearing of masks, among others. Now, what these, uh, these measures by the government did is that it's 
it made it already uh, it, it made it extremely difficult uh, for uh, for most Kenyans uh, to actually exercise their Article Seven uh, Article Thirty Seven rights. That is the right to freely picket or demonstrate. Uh, uh, before the before the 13th of March, it was already very difficult for many Kenyans to actually exercise their protest rights because we already have uh, repressive pieces of legislation like the Public Order Management Act that has been used year in year out to prevent people from actually exercising their protest rights. So. The COVID-19 pandemic actually created a conducive environment for the government to actually restrict uh, the right to protest. Uh, uh, coincidentally, uh, throughout, uh, since, uh, this, as, as, since uh, the 27th of March, when the government announced it as to don't coffee to date, uh, what was rather interesting or peculiar was that there was, uh, there was, there was a selective application of, uh, of, 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 of some of these protocols that are, were put in place by the government. So we saw our political elite actually be able to, uh, they were actually given leeway to actually exercise their right to peacefully assemble or even protest. Uh, uh, and this, and, and they did this in the pretext of um, one, preparing for the, for, for, for the, 2020, uh, for the 2022 general election that happens next, uh, later on next year. The second one, uh, the, the second instance is when we saw our political elites actually uh, trying to promote the Building uh, Bridges Initiative report, and the third one was uh, to advance uh, 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 to advance the referendum question that seek uh, that the, whose sole purpose is to actually claw back uh, many progressive gains uh, that have been brought as a result of the 2010 Constitution. Now, in stark contrast, uh, citizens in Kenya have been subjected to uh, uh, have, have not only been subjected to unlawful uh, arrest and imprisonment for actually trying to exercise their right to protest, but have been uh, viciously dispersed by, uh, by, uh, by, by, by law enforcement agencies in Kenya. And I'll just give, uh, I'll just cite uh, just three examples. The first was in honor about uh, some time in May 2020, while submitting a petition in Nairobi, uh, to, to, to the Nairobi water sharing, uh, uh, to the to Nairobi water services sharing the grievances of, of the residents of Matopeni area, protesters were arrested and charged under the regulations for, amongst others, not uh, maintaining social distancing. The other instance that you rightly pointed out, Mike, was on the 7th of July when about 57 human rights defenders were unlawfully arrested and charged uh, for participating in uh, the Sabah Sabah March of Our Lives that has been convened uh, over for, the, for, for the longest time, for, for the last 10 or so years. The third instance is in August 2020 during, uh, during uh, the arrest of the COVID-19 uh, uh, during a, a, a protest dubbed arrest COVID-19 uh, 19 protests, uh, arrest COVID-19 millionaires. So what happened, uh, so, so this protest, this particular, this particular protest that I'm citing was as a result of citizens' anger towards financial mismanagement uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So remember I pointed out that uh, this pandemic not only created a conducive environment for the government to restrict the right to protest, but there's been uh, there's been huge financial mismanagement. I think more recently, you also in the news that Kenyans were actually very mad with IMF, and we actually had over two thousand over three thousand Kenyans sign uh, 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 go on online and sign a petition calling on IMF not to give the government of Kenya. Uh, and any further funds because our head of state already admitted that we, uh, we, we are the, the, that actually about two billion is lost in daily. So that was that's why Kenyans were frustrated, mad, and they actually protested. More recently, uh, on this uh, this year, on the seventh of April, uh, twenty twenty one, about twenty one human rights defenders from the Communist Party were unlawful, uh, unlawfully arrested and charged in uh, within Nairobi court. And what was their crime? Uh, uh, the, the only crime was trying to exercise the Article 37 rights. So when you look at uh, when you look at the pro, uh, when you when you look at the bad's eye view of what the pandemic has done, it has just created a conducive environment for uh, the government to see for the uh, to, 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 to see for voices of dissent and also to restrict uh, citizens from exercising uh, their Article 37 rights. So I'll stop there for now, Mike. Over to you. Martin, thank you so much. And I mean, you know, these are really worrying numbers. Um, the statistics are high. And maybe if you wouldn't mind reflecting on sort of remedies available to those whose rights have been violated during the pandemic, and maybe that can then lead us 
through to a discussion about how we can find both domestic and reason, uh, regional solutions to this particular problem. With that, Edwin, um, you know, I remember during the, the heart of our first lockdown in March last year, South Africa's first lockdown, that there was a, a heartbreaking statistic at one stage that more people had been killed by the police than had been killed by, by COVID-19. Um, how have you seen those trends developing in South Africa and what is the current status quo? Thank you, Mike, and uh, uh, good evening also to the audience and everyone who's on the panel. Um, I've always uh, said that I think the, the government of South Africa, like most African governments, are engaged in a low intensity conflict against their own citizens, who, whose crime is only trying to vindicate the rights that they've been granted by the constitutions of their countries, and also international law, if you look at the uh, other instruments like the ICCPR, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the African Charter, and so on. And most of the time, these governments do not have any, any reluctance in, in promulgating constitutions that seem to be so liberal. And hence, I call them a reluctant liberal democ democracies, which only do give those laws only for uh, diplomatic expediency and to be seen to be progressive rather than real willingness to see those, those uh, values that are in those constitutions realized. That is, South Africa is one example of such. Uh, the Constitution of South Africa, Section 17 says, everyone has the right to, to demonstrate peacefully. And um, in, the, in the first few days of the lockdown, I think as you have uh, rightly alluded, uh, um, embarrassingly, there were at least 11 people killed by law enforcement within the first two weeks of the first lockdown in 2020. That is disturbing because at that time, the number of deaths caused by law enforcement, overuse of force and, and, and unnecessary use of force was exceeding the number of, uh, of deaths by COVID at that particular time. Now, there is a case called Mlungwana versus the state uh, in which I have quoted even previously in our previous engagement, which had said that there is no need for the criminalization of uh, somebody failing, uh, the convener failing to notify the authorities about the intention to, to protest. However, it seems that that case, although a very well-written case, uh, has not caused any changes because even now within many municipalities, people are still being arrested, for failing to notify the authorities about their, their protests. And uh, it seems there's no respect for the law. And what worries us even more is the fact that nothing happens to those who are so contemptuous towards the orders of the courts. And it's, as, it's business as usual. I think that points to the breakdown in the rule of law whose who's, uh, much uh, prevalence has been brought under the spotlight by COVID. There's been so many things that have happened that have brought me to question whether indeed there's still the rule of law in South Africa uh, 26 years after democracy. Now, uh, this week, um, brought memories of uh, one Andrew Satani who was killed by the use of rubber bullets in 2011. In that particular case, Mr. Tatani, like many other South Africans, was engaged in a protest uh, due to poor se service delivery and was beaten severely and also shot at close range with rubber bullets and died on the spot. In the ensuing case that followed, um, I think that's Muilua versus the state, or state versus Muilua. The magistrate stated that the, the protest that Mr. Tatani was engaged in had sinister motives, and that if it wasn't because of his behavior, he would still be alive. Now, call it that is victim blaming of the biggest bigger. It's embarrassing for a magistrate to say that in, in, during, uh, in a democracy like South Africa, that somebody who protests against poor service delivery, lack of water. Uh, poor housing, uh, poor governance should be blamed for having sinister motives by protesting. Just a few weeks ago, that's on the 10th of March, another protester, uh, Mr. Mkolisi Ntumba was also shot at close range. He wasn't even a protester, let me say, he was a bystander during a protest. Emerging out of the doctor's surgery, was met by a hail of rubber bullets and he also died on the spot. 
Now, the question that comes is also, are South African police officers even trained in the use of the equipment that they must, that they use during protests? Or are even those, that equipment necessary for enforcing the law during protests? My, my conviction is no, because most of the protests that people end up dying, like Mr. Tatani, like Mr. Ntumba, um, are not violent, or whose, the threshold of violence does not reach that point where one has to use rubber bullets, especially using them wrongly um, to enforce the law. So the question now brings the, 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 the spotlight around the use of rubber bullets because they cause so much concern. They are the ones that cause a lot of death during protests. So the question is, is it necessary to use rubber bullets during protests as it has happened so, so much during this, uh, this pandemic? Before I forget, let me also state that after Mr. Ntumba was killed on the 10th and the use of rubber bullets came under the spotlight, another protester was killed um, on the 14th. That is two days ago, I think yesterday also by rubber bullets. So how are these rubber bullets being used um, during protests and why are they being used? Are there no less uh, harmful ways in which protests in South Africa can be, can be policed without such lethal means? I, I, I refuse to say that rubber bullets are less lethal. They're less, they are less lethal if used correctly. If not used correctly, they're as lethal as any full metal jacket because at close range, they kill. It has already been proven countless times in South Africa. Um, and so they are meant to be used at a distance. And if used correctly, it should be more like being hit with a paintball if you're using rubber bullets rightly. But if you use them at close range and they cause the piercing of the skin, then they, they will definitely cause death. And I'm so concerned about the use of rubber bullets. That's why I'm dwelling so much on the subject. And I wish that the people who are the policy makers would be listening to this particular engagement that we're having that as long as we continue to kill our people with rubber bullets, we are enemies of the people. I think the government of South Africa has turned itself to be enemies of the people and does not want to vindicate the rights of the people to enjoy the rights in the constitution. I have always said that the government is the agent of happiness uh, in a democracy. And our government here in South Africa is not, but it's an agent of the devil in that they do not want to be seen to be doing what the people voted them for but simply causing mishap and sadness among the lives of people. But as the LRC and other organizations that are involved in this, in, in this uh, lib, lib, I mean, in liberties organizations, um, okay, thank you, Mike, I see that. Um, we will always go to, to the litigation route, the advocacy route and go on media and engage in, in, in forums like this in order to, to assist the government where it's failing to do what is right by the people. Thank you. Edwin, thank you so much. And I mean, you know, three key themes jump out there. The first is, you know, this notion of a, a low intensity conflict um, by states against their citizens. The second is the application of adherence to the rule of law. And I suppose in the COVID context that brings us yeah, there's interesting discussions to be had here about restrictions on gatherings restriction sizes and how general application of the law has taken place throughout the pandemic. And then thirdly, Edwin, you raised the important issue of the misuse of crowd control or, or less lethal weapons um, and what steps um, should be taken to ensure that these weapons are properly regulated, properly developed, that their trade is regulated and ultimately that they are appropriate uh, manners in which these weapons are used. So thank you for, for that engagement. If I can then turn to, to you, Emerson, you know, for those of us who have the privilege of access uh, to social media, um, to the internet, to streaming services, I think we all watched um, as, you know, the ensuing fallout following the murder of George Floyd um, occurred in the US last year. And, you know, I know, Emerson, you, you've spent many times, uh, we spent a lot of time in Banjul at the African Commission, and you understand the context within which the, the Commission operates. For the benefit, you know, of the panelists and participants, do you have any comparative examples about how protest was best facilitated um, in the midst of COVID-19? 
and any best practices or examples that we as civil society actors and activists can look to to better facilitate and enable protest in Africa. Sure, thanks very much, Michael. And it's a pleasure to be with everyone. I just wish we could all be in Banjul at the moment and, and head out for some fish on the beach afterwards. But alas, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, in this forum anyway. Um, so I would just make a couple of quick points. As you mentioned, I'm at the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, we're a 101 year old organization uh, and we have offices in all 50 states. And I think just as a, as a note for those at the ACHPR, it's worth noting that we have several million members and are primarily supported by those members. So I think, you know, in terms of thinking about best practices and models to, to replicate, I think the ACLU model is one um, that is firmly rooted. We're a massive national organization, but with our feet firmly rooted in the grassroots, which I, I think is, is a model that is worth um, replicating. But getting to the point at hand in terms of uh, policing, obviously the summer of 2020 was extremely busy for us at the ACLU and for everybody working on protest and civil rights in the United States. We at the ACLU, as I mentioned, have offices in all 50 states, including in Minnesota. And so our Minnesota office was on the ground and one of the first to react after George Floyd was killed uh, and the protest broke out. And we ended up lodging cases, litigation, in dozens of states uh, and municipalities. Uh, most of these were about the right to protest, protecting the right to protest, but also the use of excessive force. And this connects directly to the work of INCLO around, uh, as Edwin was saying, less lethal weapons in very strong quotation marks. Uh, but what we saw was the use of rubber bullets. We saw the use of tear gas. We saw the use of all sorts of um, different tools by the police. Uh, where they were cracking down in large part on pro peaceful protesters and where, you know, protesters were engaged in violence, uh, you know, their response, the police responsibility is to isolate uh, those individuals who are breaking the law and protect everybody else's right to continue protesting. Uh, and again and again, police officers failed to do so. And I would just note that similar to SARS, um, the, uh, the NSARS protests, there's a very special flavor of protest when you're protesting against the police, right? When you're protesting against taxes, when you're protesting against healthcare, those things are all important, but there's a very special dynamic when what you're protesting is the people who have guns and they're standing right across from you. So uh, in the United States over this summer and continuing now, I, you know, I'm sure those who are following the news know that we've had another, uh, another killing just miles away in Minnesota this week and protests are happening again. So we brought these cases, uh, we had some preliminary success, but um, we also had situations where we won in the courts. Uh, the court said that the police are no longer, must immediately cease using these tactics. And the police went right out the next day and continued using rubber bullets, tear gas, and the like. And so what we have seen is that while courts have been, we've been surprisingly successful in many places, uh, you know, maybe it's not surprising that the courts are not going to fix this situation for us. What the other ways that we've been trying to push outside of the courts is through know your rights uh, materials, trying to make sure that people who are maybe new to protesting uh, understand what the what the rules are and, and what the lines are that they should that they should be aware of. But of course, you know, we can talk about the law and we can talk about policies and we as lawyers are trying to change the laws and change the policies, but then there's also what happens in practice, right? So uh, there are just these vast limitations in what we can do. You know, we can get a judge to say that, that, that the police need to let people peacefully protest, but those who are in the streets uh, face to face with these police officers might face a very different reality. So I think that that's just something that we always have to keep in mind when we're talking about establishing these guidelines, international norms, human rights, even the US Constitution. Uh, of course, when we're in the streets and we're face to face with the police, it's a whole different story. The two last things I would mention quickly, if I have another minute, Michael, one is that we've we've been supporting. We actually worked quite hard with a lot of other folks, uh, primarily folks in Africa to to uh, all over Africa to introduce a UN resolution about uh, police brutality, systemic racism and the repression of protests. And unfortunately, and I think this is a familiar story for those of us who are in, who are familiar with working with international organizations, as Michael mentioned, I worked for years with the African Commission on the guidelines on peaceful assembly and association. 
And, you know, as you've all seen, when you work on these documents that go through these international bodies, they go in one way and they might come out a very different way. And tragically, I think uh, the UN resolution ended up not mentioning the United States by name in the final version of the resolution. And this is something that we saw also at the African Commission. You know, there is always a hesitancy on the part of these international organizations to name names, even when they're willing to make a relatively progressive stance when it comes to policy. So, uh, that's one point in terms of international advocacy, which I think will be familiar to many of you. Uh, but then the last point is just on COVID restrictions more generally. And the ACLU has long been a defender of civil liberties. We push back against government overreach, uh, whether it's Republicans or Democrats or any other party. Uh, so we obviously, you know, the hairs on the back of our neck stand up when people start issuing mandates uh, and telling people when and when they when and where they can go. But obviously, in the midst of a global pandemic, you know, there are things that we need to all do to keep each other safe. So the way that we've looked at these types of restrictions is making sure that one, that they're temporary. You know, we don't want these rules to outlast the crisis. Um, so we don't we've been really wary of any sort of permanent changes to rules in light of the pandemic. We've been wary of anything that's content or viewpoint based. That is. Uh, and this is where we've actually had a, a lot of action in the courts around whether churches need to be treated in a special way, in a positive way, or if they're being treated in a, in a negative way. And basically, we think that all gatherings, whatever the topic, whatever the, the, the group, have to be treated equally. Uh, so it can be indoors or outdoors. It doesn't matter whether it's a church service or a protest. Uh, we need to have rules that are neutral. And finally, they need to be science-based. Right, so this can't just be some policymaker saying this is my opportunity uh, to pass this thing that I've been wanting to because there's a bunch of stuff going on in the streets. Uh, but it has to be science based. It has to be temporary, and it has to be content and viewpoint neutral. Um, so I'll stop there, but happy to answer any other questions and, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Emerson. And I mean, you know, thank you for for that guidance and the the use of strategic litigation. I suppose in this instance, not even strategic litigation, just mass litigation which has always been a benefit of the ACLU that you can run to multiple different courts at the same time and exert influence through those processes. So thank you, thank you for that overview and that insight. I suppose on a lighter note, thank you for reminding us all about how much we actually do miss Banjul, notwithstanding uh, the travel and the complications of, of getting to the Gambia, but how much we do miss uh, meeting in person. And, and hopefully that can return at some stage soon. So there's been a, a really nice comment uh, from Margaret, which is a segue uh, to open the conversation, noting that there have been significant protests in Malawi over the course of the year, uh, over the year, but not one single person has been injured. And I think, you know, we've heard from Martin, we've heard from Edwin around about the real difficulties that we've experienced with state regulation of COVID-19 and the excessive use of force. But, you know, Osai, we have seen, I think through NSARS, positive outcomes from the exercise of the right to protest and we're seeing the same in Malawi so maybe you know here I would encourage participants to to pose more reflections or questions either in the chat or the Q&A but for now maybe a question to panelists and please just you know turn your uh, turn your mute off if you if you want to stage an intervention but what are some other positive stories that have come out of protests during COVID-19 and where has the exercise of the right had significant impact? So maybe I can bounce it to you and just ask if you've seen, you know, what have the outcomes of the NSARS protests ultimately been? It was a turbulent October. Where, where is Nigeria now? So for me, I think the positive is the active consciousness. A lot more people are aware of what they could do. Um, the NSAS protests gave a glimpse of a different world. So that energy is still quite high, even though a lot more people are in different groups. So we've not, be, we've not seen that huge mobilization that we saw in October, but conversations are happening online. They're happening offline. People are deploying tools using technology in order to meet, in order to find creative ways of expression. We saw a lot of interest with um, artists, musicians. So music uh, is uh, streaming online. 
uh, that have subtle messages. So for example, recently we have Angelique Kijo. She did a collaboration with um, Yemi Alade, a Nigerian musician on a song called Dignity. And it's all about why we're standing up and asking for respect. Um, Amnesty International, we did a video with some young upcoming artists. One was a spoken word um, artist who shared a story about the Nigeria they want to see. So these are subtle ways of resistance that we are seeing, but it's also a means through which we inform, we educate, we raise awareness and prepare people for when there'll be another opportunity. The other good thing about it is that it showed how organization could happen with young people leading such uh, processes. So there's a lot more that I think is going to come out and there are going to be a lot more protests, despite the fact that the Nigerian authorities have said no public gatherings, the usual thing. But as Nigeria is one of those countries that we're not having the high numbers, we're assuming that we'll survive this second wave with a stronger um, pull towards um, vaccinations. But we're also seeing that people will take the protest online and the diaspora interest, the Nigerian diaspora interest in what is going on in Nigeria is also giving Nigerians in country another support, another backup. That you'd say something, there are people in the corridors of uh, power in Washington, London, Canada, elsewhere, who will continue to bring forth the messages and keep it high on the media's attention. It was the international, the diaspora that made it possible for you all to hear about NSAS, otherwise the local media was already suppressed and they're already feeling intimidated about breaking stories about this. So that I think was a, a good positive from our experience. Now, so I, can, I, I, I wanna keep this theme of energy and maybe it's something I'll, I'll come to you on Emerson about you know, protest energy and when that tips into protest fatigue and how that can be managed. But as I, there's a, a Q&A note about, you know, what was a, a contemporary idea about establishing specialized units, um, anti-SARS being one of them, and the effect that these units have ultimately not turned out as planned, both in the Nigerian context, and then Martin, if I can come to you after a side, in the Kenyan context as well. And what is it that we do in terms of establishing or capacitating the police through training, for the establishment of units, how do we go, where do we go from here effectively to ensure that protests are facilitated and not policed? Aside, can I turn to you and then to Mark? Oh, so definitely, um, the failure of SARS and other tactical units in Nigeria, it's more about the failure of oversight. So you train people because the SARS units are the most trained officers of the police units perhaps outside of those in the intelligence services. So they are well-trained. So one good thing um, that came out from the SARS protest was that the training needs to be more holistic, make sure human rights focused perspectives are mainstream throughout their training. So we don't want to stand alone human rights course. We want it mainstream. So if you do this, this is what you do in protest, this how you handle conversations, how you handle suspects, how you manage that. But the biggest challenge is getting our independent oversight bodies to work. And some of us feel that because Nigeria was under military rule for such a long time, there's always this resistance by military and paramilitary forces to have civilian oversight. And most of the bodies that are responsible for recruitment, uh, retraining, hiring, tend to still depend on the same bodies they are supposed to be controlling and having oversight over. So hopefully with the new police act and the new regulations that they should develop and the Human Rights Commission, the National Human Rights Commission um, currently now being strengthened by having its governing council established because we've not had a governing council for nearly seven years, we might begin to see greater oversight, which then means that when people know they are being watched, they are less likely to commit the crimes because they know they won't get away with it. One of the mantras the SARS officers had when they had victims was to tell them, I would shoot you and nothing would happen. And so far they've been able to get away with it. But with what is happening now with the panels, with um, the cases Amnesty has highlighted, 
civil society groups are following through are beginning, they're beginning to see now that no matter where you go, you'll be found up and you need to face justice eventually. So strengthening the oversight mechanisms would be a strong way to address this issue. And of course, any training has to be mainstreamed, uh, gender, human rights, and ensure discipline happens. If someone is found wanting, discipline them. And if a crime has been committed, make sure they face the law. Thank you, Asai. You know, Martin, Kenya suffers uh, from similar complications, particularly uh, when it comes to enforced disappearances by specialized policing units. And, you know, in the Kenyan context, there's been a long history of this. What, what steps have been taken and how can that be properly mitigated, particularly in the disappearance of activists and, and protesters? Okay, th thanks, Mike. So the steps that have been taken by Kenya in the recent past to address uh, the specific issue of, of enforced disappearance is that uh, first and foremost, a few years ago, we came up with the, with the Independent Policing Oversight Authority that is a civilian led. So this body has been able to uh, conduct comprehensive oversight on the conduct of uh, law enforcement agencies within Kenya. Uh, other than that, uh, uh, since uh, 2011, we have seen a significant, uh, to date, we have seen, um, I could say we've, see, we've seen a slight change uh, with what is happening in the past and the present. So now we have police officers who have actually been charged, who have been found uh, guilty for committing excesses or even for committing murder, which was not, uh, which is a stark difference from when, uh, before 2010, whereby it was very difficult to actually hold uh, a police officer accountable in courts of law. So there are more cases of police accountability. We all, uh, there was also the creation, uh, there's also been the creation of the internal affairs unit, that is a unit within uh, the National Police Service that actually uh, citizens use to uh, file complaints. So they've come up with uh, an online platform called IRIS, whereby citizens can uh, uh, anonymously actually file complaints against police officers. And then other than that, there's been um, there's been a lot of work done uh, by civil society in terms of documenting cases of police excesses, specifically the Kenyan Human Rights Commission and other partners within the Missing Voices platform. So what Missing Voices does is that we just specifically document cases of unlawful killings and, uh, and, and enforced disappearances. So when we engage uh, the relevant state actors, that is the National Police Service, our Ministry of Interior and Coordination of National Government, and even uh, the relevant committees in parliament, uh, we have a, it's, it's, it's more or less of a conversation on how do you hold uh, police officers accountable because you actually have the statistics of the excesses uh, that they've committed. Uh, Ali, uh, on, on, on the 20, uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about three weeks ago, the Missing Voices Coalition actually launched uh, its second annual report whereby they documented over 100, and, uh, think of, over 100 cases of unlawful killings. Uh, and that is in the backdrop, uh, just within the span of one year, within the pandemic itself, about over 30 Kenyans lost their lives and uh, as a result of uh, police bullets and a number of human rights defenders uh, uh, were, were, uh, were disappeared uh, as a result, uh, as, as a result of, uh, of, of operations by law enforcement agencies. So I would stop at that. But if let me go back to the initial question that you'd ask about uh, the positivity from um, uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, from the Kenyan perspective, what I can say is that it's, uh, it's actually, uh, I think the, the, the restrictions and, 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 and uh, the, the restrictions that have been put in place by, uh, by, by the government in, uh, in Kenya has only, uh, has, has only made uh, human rights defenders and, and civil society actors actually, uh, they've toughened their resolve. So uh, the unfortunate reality is that they've tried to uh, prevent citizens from, uh, from, from actually exercising their protest rights by arresting them, by actually uh, unlawfully charging them and setting high uh, stiff bail, uh, bail, bail, uh, bail conditions, which is a stark uh, difference, uh, which is a stark difference from what is provided for in our constitution where it says bail should be reasonable. Uh, but this is not preventing Kenyans from, uh, from, 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 from actually exercising their protest rights. So that is a positive because ordinarily you'd expect repressive pieces of legislation to restrict people from exercising their right. The other, uh, the, 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 the other positive thing is that Kenyans have embraced uh, innovative ways of protesting. Uh, and, and, and the recent one was what I cited in my earlier presentation whereby over uh, 200,000 Kenyans actually signed an online petition uh, just uh, the, the, the expressing their displeasure 
on the intended uh, loan that uh, Kenya wanted to take from the World Bank. And that is against the backdrop that uh, our president told us that uh, we lose two billion on a daily. So we we're asking ourselves, so if we lose, if, if two billion is stolen on, on a daily, then why is the government boring? Yeah, so I'll stop at that. If, if you could just give me one minute, Mike, in terms of uh, what needs to be done uh, for, for the law enforcement agencies, I think they need to be, um, uh, coincidentally, uh, the, Kenya, the National Police Service in Kenya is well-funded. They've actually uh, undertaken various trainings, but there needs to be, uh, I think what needs to happen is a fundamental culture change because year in, year out, they've received uh, support from uh, civil society organizations, from the government itself, and even from the donor community to undertake various trainings on human rights. Uh, but yeah, in, yeah, out, we still see them committing violations. So this uh, probably this time, uh, there's need for us to have a conversation around them having a culture change and then also holding them more accountable. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Martin. So, you know, just reflecting on, on some of the comments coming through on chat and in the Q&A, I'm, I'm not certain we're gonna get to, to all of them, but I just wanna highlight a few. The first being, Ibrahima, your, your protest is certainly noted. Um, we will ensure as INCLO when we go into future um, webinars that we take all reasonable steps we can to ensure that there's multiple languages or translations available to facilitate engagement. So thank you, thank you for raising that. There's also a couple of comments about the media and Emerson, if here I can turn to you to address sort of two questions. The first is how you enable sort of this protest energy that Asai was talking about and how you mitigate protest fatigue. I suppose that's the first. And that then segues into the question about the media. Um, there, there are two notes in, in the Q&A block. It's how has the media in the different jurisdictions represented on this call reported on protest? And have they been an enabling force or otherwise? And just some reflections on, on press freedom during COVID-19. That would be the first. The second, if panelists want to reflect on it, is how we can now regulate going forward. There's a note on the use of drones, um, which are unregulated at this stage. And what is it technically that the African Commission may want to do now with the benefit of having seen the misuses or the violations of protest rights during COVID-19? So Emerson, let's start with you on the question of energy and the media and then open it up in closing to the rest of the panelists. Um, around the question of media and what can be done going forward. Sure, thanks so much. And I'll, I'll try to be as quick as I can. I think, you know, the ACLU, it's not, we do organize some protests, but it's not really our job necessarily to provide the energy. Uh, I mean, I've always conceptualized protests as sort of people venting their, their frustrations, right? And getting their voices out there. It's not necessarily going to lead directly to policy change, but what we have seen is that protest works in terms of changing the national dialogue. The way that people are discussing race and police in the United States today is dramatically different from even two years ago, never mind five years ago or 10 years ago. And I think the credit for that has to go to all of the people who bravely put themselves and their bodies on the line as much as any of the policy professionals or attorneys or others who've pushed for some, some sort of more concrete uh, steps. We've seen um, you know, some, some divestment. One of the main calls from the BLM protests was for divestment from policing. And we have seen some localities take steps uh, to decrease their police budgets, but that is a very hard thing to actually achieve. Uh, and still further, we have to see the cultural shift uh, and then the inevitable backlash. But I think we have, I think it's undeniable that the protests have been successful in the United States in terms of shifting uh, the, the, the conversation. I think the last point around media and tech, I think are actually kind of linked in a way in the ACLU's work because we share the, the concerns raised by Ibrahima and a few others around surveillance and drones. And this is something that we've worked a great deal on. You can check our website and see some of the different resources we've produced. Obviously the courts and the legal system are not well suited to dealing with new types of technology, right? So the question is, how are we gonna apply these old rules to the new technology? And, or if we create new rules, how do we make sure that we're not creating more problems for ourselves in the process? Uh, and linked to that, 
we've seen how, how important media has been in terms of getting these people's voices out, spreading them around the world. Uh, you know, one protester in one place is, 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 is not that significant, but when that image is beamed around the world and accompanied by stories on a bunch of different outlets, obviously it can have a much broader impact. So we have seen the critical importance of media. We've seen media targeted. Many of our clients in these excessive force cases have actually been media. We had somebody who was blinded in one eye being shot with, a, I think it was a beanbag gun, and that person was a reporter. We've been careful not to put sort of reporters on a pedestal above other protesters, but certainly, uh, you know, when, when, when journalists are attacked, uh, we all suffer. Uh, and I think one of the issues that we found, though, is that we are adamant that the public recording of police must be protected by freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom of association, right? So in, in the United States, it's the First Amendment. So if we insist that citizen journalists have the right to record and gather all of this information, and without those citizen journalists and their posting on social media, our movement would never be as far along as it is now. At the same time, we want to limit the government's ability to use facial recognition, to use drones, and to use other types of surveillance. And the issue that we've run into is that courts are sometimes hesitant. They say, look, you have no expectation of privacy. If everybody around you is recording it on their cell phones and they're posting it online, how can you then say that the police don't have the right to record that same place if you knew that you're not in the privacy of your own home, so you have no expectation of privacy while you're engaging in these types of activities? So we are adamant that the government has to have some boundaries on its ability to, to gather information and invade people's privacy, while at the same time protecting citizens' rights, and, and you know, not just citizens, anyone's right uh, to gather information and post that information online for, for the public good. So it's a longer conversation, but I think trying to achieve both of those goals at the same time is not always very, uh, very straightforward. Thank you, Emerson. I'm conscious of time. Um, Edwin, can we maybe take one last brief submission from you and then we'll move in, into closing out? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, I think let me quickly state that I think one thing that, is, uh, that has come to our attention is that the more people protested, either physically or online, despite the, the, the lack of uh, acceptance by the government that that is happening, uh, we have seen at times the government change some, lessen some of the, the, the harshness of the regulations, for example. Although sometimes it would come with President Ramaphosa saying one thing and then Mkosaza Nazuma saying something else to, you know, kind of water down whatever was said. It has helped people in a way to lessen the harshness of the regulations, some of which were mostly unreasonable. Some has led, you know, sometimes we have ended up in court where the court has said the regulations are unconstitutional and it ended up with those regulations being made less harsh. Secondly, uh, with us at the LRC and other organizations that we work with, for example, we work with the Omega Research Foundation on the use of, uh, of less lethal tools and on the misuse of certain equipment for of, uh, use for law enforcement. The more we see these things happening, it helps us to devise strategies on how we, we can approach government and, and step up our advocacy efforts to try and get those, those, those tools to be taken off law enforcement. And finally, I think one thing that has been brought under the spotlight as well is the inequalities in South Africa during this protest. There are those people who want to go out and protest, and then there are those who are very privileged and rich and, and more intelligent than the others who say, you know, the police must be more brutal. I've seen people literally begging the government to be more brutal on those that they perceive to be breaking the, the lockdown regulations. That is sad because, you know, um, if you try to, to, to fight those that are fighting for their liberties, for your security, you will end up having none. So I do believe that one thing that we should also do uh, going forward is to educate people on the balancing of, of, of security and also freedoms and, and fundamental rights. Thank you. Edwin, thank you. And, and thank you to, to all panelists and participants. As with most things, I wish we had 15 more minutes. Um, but um, alas, you know, we're coming to the end of this particular webinar. Maybe just four points for reflection as we move on from today. The one is uh, invasive surveillance technologies, which increasingly are used against activists and protesters, and how it is that we as civil society can push back and substantially reduce or ensure that there's appropriate regulation of any use of such technologies. I think that's one overarching point. The second is what 
can be done at the African Commission specifically. And it strikes me that the guidelines on freedom of assembly association that Emerson referred to make no reference to pandemics. They make no reference to states of emergencies or states of disasters. So there may be a small bit of work that can be done around the particular guidelines and equally looking to points that are raised in the Q&A about the use of drones and particularly where crowd control weapons may affix to drones and weapons are discharged from above. I think there are some serious questions that need to be asked there. Lastly, as a contemporary trend that I think all of us reflect on in our homes and our communities and our organizations, is the impact of social media and what role social media has played in enabling protests during the pandemic, but equally in the distribution of mistis and mal information. And I think those are four points that we can take forward from here and reflect on as we move forward. So with that said, I really just want to shout out and thank uh, Laura Carr from INCLU. She's the project manager for protest rights and police and for pulling all of this together. Laura has correctly reminded me that in the next week, we will be launching an INCLU report from the 15 jurisdictions that details implications of protest during COVID-19 and measures that have been taken to champion that right. So you can have a look at the INCLU website, INCLU.net for the release of that report in the next couple of weeks. And then a big thank you to the panelists. Thank you for taking the time and preparing presentations and fielding questions. And lastly, most importantly, thank you to the panelists. We hope we've added to your virtual African Commission session, and we hope that we can all move from here with reflections as to how we can affect positive change. So with that, we'll close out this particular webinar. Thank you to everyone again, and we hope that you all stay safe.